in essence, many of these patients are effectively guinea pigs and they don't even know it. Okay, so next up, we can ask you, I think, uh, to our next speaker. I'm very grateful that Dr. Azim Mahalter has come here to join us this morning. And um, he's going to speak to us today about choosing wisely and leading on from one of the last questions about whether we, if we are using too much medicine. And we look forward to Azim's comments. Thank you. Um, I'm really delighted to be here today, so I just want to start by thanking Sally, Joe, and Scott in particular for inviting me to speak. And to be honest, it's a real honour to, to speak in a, in a keynote session following on from David Wood, the President of World Health Federation. And Simon, actually, who is, uh, you know, he's, a, he's, he's become a very good friend of mine over the last few years. He's also been a mentor and an inspiration in a lot of work I've done. Uh, and before I start, I just want to also just thank, um, special thanks to Professor Samuel Gray, Simon I've mentioned, Terence Stevenson, who is the current chair of the GMC, uh, Professor James Sue Bailey, the uh, chair of the Academy of Medical Colleges, recently just left, and Fiona Godley and Professor Rita Redberg, editors of the BMJ and JAMA Internal Medicine. So I just want to start with a slide, just a bit of, bit of a reminder about evidence-based medicine, because that's what we try and practice. And David Sackett is considered one of the fathers of evidence-based medicine, and there are three components that are important when, when, it, when we talk about evidence-based practice. Individual clinical expertise of the doctor or the, the practitioner, best available clinical evidence, and last but certainly not least is patient values and expectations. And I want you to think about that as I go through this talk, about how much of patient values and expectations is involved in the way we communicate with patients. The reality is, sadly, when we talk about best available clinical evidence, um, evidence-based medicine, in my view, and I'm going to present some evidence for this in the next uh, 20 minutes or 25 minutes or so, has been hijacked. It has been hijacked by vested interests. And one of the other things that David Sackett said, which I think is very interesting, is that half of what you learn in medical school, start with humility here, really, half of what you learn in medical school will be shown to be either dead wrong or out of date within five years of your graduation. The trouble is, nobody can tell you which half, therefore the most important thing you can do is to learn how to learn on your own. And I think over the last few years since I qualified, um, and, and my background very briefly is I'm a, uh, I train as an interventional cardiologist, and rather like Scott, have gone down the prevention route, and you may be able to hopefully realize why that is by the end of my talk. Um, I have, I've learned quite a lot in the last few years. I've challenged a lot of my core beliefs from when I started out as a medical doctor. Sadly, we have, right now, a complete healthcare system failure and an epidemic of misinformed doctors and misinformed and misled and potentially and harmed patients. And there are a number of factors behind this. Bias funding of research, this is research that's funded because it's life likely to be profitable, not beneficial for patients. Bias reporting in medical journals. Bias patient pamphlets. Bias reporting in the media. Commercial conflicts of interest. Defensive medicine. And last but by no means least, medical curricula actually fail to teach doctors how to comprehend and communicate health statistics. So let's give you some examples. Well, Clearly, a financial influence for individual doctors to earn more based upon number of, investiga sorry, number of investigations and procedures can sometimes put profits before patients. For a minority, greed smothers the conscience. So one US cardiologist was jailed for ordering $19 million worth of unnecessary investigations and procedures. In America, they have a fee-for-service model which contributes to overuse. So the more tests and procedures you do, the more you get paid. And clearly, that's a problem. In the UK, we do things a lot better, but certainly there is also this financial incentive. We have something called payment by results for hospitals, which in, in its essence is payment by activity. So in actual terms, it's quite similar, but not to the same extremes as the US. Just to give you an example, so I you know, practice as an interventional cardiologist and trained as one. And in America, it's estimated that unnecessary coronary stenting for stable disease actually is costing US healthcare about $2.4 billion a year. And almost 50% of stents that are done in the United States for stable disease were of questionable value. And we know that there's a very large body of accepted evidence from randomized controlled trials that stenting actually doesn't improve prognosis or prevent heart attacks. Yet, 
88% of patients thought they were having the procedure for those very reasons. And this is quite shocking, really, but 43% of cardiologists, when anonymously asked, said they would still go ahead and do the procedure if they knew it wouldn't benefit the patient. And there are other drivers to overuse, technological imperative, you know, new devices come on the market, doctors, surgeons like to use those things, they, they can sometimes drive uh, over-treatment as well. So let's just talk briefly about technological drive. So for many years, for decades, we used something called an intraortic balloon pump. It's still being used, but not as much as it used to be. And this was um, essentially, for many of you may know this, for people in cardiogenic shock, intraortic balloon pump is a device that's put in that was initially based upon industry-sponsored observational studies in the belief that it would re reduce mortality in those very high-risk sick cardiac patients with MIs. And actually, um, in terms of the cost of, uh, of the pump, and you know, a specialist cardiac center will have maybe one or two of these, 40,000 pounds, so it's not cheap. Each catheter per patient, about 800 pounds. And 140,000 of those have been used worldwide on a yearly basis for many years. And then a paper comes out, I'm sorry, and, and it's not without harm. And, and I've managed, you know, intraortic balloon pumps. I'm, so, I'm sure some of the nurses and cardiologists and doctors here have done that as well. And it can be quite resource intense, intensive. And it's not without complications, you know. Luckily, don't happen that often, but they do happen occasionally. Stroke, hematoma, kidney failure, even limb amputation very rarely. And we now know it has absolutely no benefit for the original reason it was designed. It does not reduce mortality uh, at 30 days or one year. So we've used this device for a long time in the belief that it was benefiting patients. We now have good quality evidence to say that it doesn't really improve their outcomes. Another quick example of thrombectomy catheter. Not the, the harm with thrombectomy catheter and cough, is, the cost is not so much. This has been used in acute coronary syndrome, essentially a device to suck out clot for people suffering heart attacks. And again, we now realize that it doesn't have any significant benefit for the primary reason it was being used. And in the NHS, we've been costing about two million pounds per year to use that. So there's a few questions that we need to ask ourselves. Certainly, can we improve the system that allows the introduction of these new devices um, to minimize harms? Can we get better quality evidence before they get you know, introduced onto the population and the public? And what about more transparency with patients? Because in essence, you know, speaking as a doctor, and even if I'm a patient, you know, in essence, many of these patients are effectively guinea pigs, and they don't even know it. So um, there were two editorials that I wrote consecutively uh, by coincidence. The first one was in 2013 in the British Medical Journal about too much angioplasty and sort of highlighting some of these concerns about lack of transparency with patients when it comes to stenting. And um, it was actually pegged on the fact that the level of misinformation went all the way up to the President of the United States, the ex-President of the United States, George Bush. He, um, the story was this, that he basically was very fit and well. He'd even cycled 100, mi 100 miles a week before he went for a routine check with his cardiologist and somehow ended up having a stent put in. We don't know all the details, but it's very likely that he wasn't made aware there was no prognostic benefit. So um, I uh, published an editorial a few months later. I was invited to write for JAMA Internal Medicine. And actually, at this point, I, I actually put forward and said, well, actually, why don't we just be more honest with patients and just make it the default on the consent form that um, actually putting a stent in for stable disease does not improve prognosis. Now, of course, for people with limiting angina, there is certainly a potential benefit there when medical therapy has failed. I'm not doubting that. But obviously, if most patients think they're having it done for improving prognosis, and we know it doesn't, there's clearly a problem there. And it's not without harms. You know, I've done hundreds of PCIs in, in my career, thousands of angiograms, and patients will have complications. It happens. I remember seeing a patient, a lady in her early 60s, who essentially had uh, died on the table as a complication of a PCI. And I just thought to myself, I thought, you know, and she was otherwise quite stable. If she hadn't had the p procedure, the PCI, she probably would still be alive today. But it's not only about that, is that if she'd been told explicitly about whether you know, the, the PCI wasn't going to improve her prognosis, she may have probably made a, diff she may have made a different decision and decided that she didn't want to take, uh, undergo PCI. Because there is still a 1% risk of heart attack, stroke, or death with, with PCI and stable disease. Anyway, so this was press released, uh, the fact that I was making this call. And uh, it was on BBC News, and I just said, listen, let's be more transparent with patients because this is causing potential harms and you know, it's better quality care. And interestingly, the uh, BBC correspondent asked the British Cardiovascular Intervention Society to comment, and their response was this, which is interesting. Um, there was no evidence that in the UK that patients had been, tr had been treated inappropriately. So we know about a third of all stents in the UK are, 
for stable disease. And that changing the consent forms is not the best way of ensuring patients understood their treatment. I mean, interesting. I mean, I don't necessarily agree with, agree with that. I think it's about transparent communication. But Terence Stevenson, who at that time was the chair of the academy and now chair of the GMC, disagreed and actually thought, actually, this is a really important discussion that needs to be introduced. Now, I did not predict this, but several months later, JAMA Internal Medicine then published a study where they actually put that scenario to patients. And in the scenario where they actually told patients lack of prognostic benefit, there was a significant reduction, about 25% less patients opted for PCI. And they calculated that just having this conversation with patients, which I do routinely when it comes to PCI, across the United States, in terms of overuse, it would reduce the overuse to the level where they would save $864 million in US health care every year, just from a conversation which, to be honest, doesn't take more than 30 seconds for most people, if you do it properly. Okay, so we have this assumption, there is still a perception out there that more medicine is better. And Jack Wenberg in the United States, who's an re eminent researcher in healthcare variation, actually found that in United States regions where there was more spending on healthcare, actually there was worse mortality outcomes, lower perceived access and less patient satisfaction. And the factors that he cited that were risk factors for this were more frequency of physician visits, more frequent use of specialist consultations, more tests, and, a, and greater use of hospital intensive care spending in these high spending regions. And the other thing that is very interesting, we talk about end of life care, I think that's a, a debate and an ethical discussion that's still ongoing here as well, is that they found that actually of people that were essentially dying in the last year of life, uh, elderly patients, about a third of them actually went, underwent an inpatient surgical procedure in their last year of, of life, um, almost 20% in their last month of life, and really it's quite staggering. Somebody that's dying in palliation, 8% underwent an inpatient uh, invasive procedure in their last week of life. And Jack Wenberg concludes that getting beyond the more medicine is better assumption will actually require a national debate on the limitation of medicine's power to heal and more of a discussion on the quality of care of end of life. So I'm just really putting it out there just for you to think about that a little bit. Okay, so let's talk about health statistics. A risk factor for misinformation? Absolutely. What's the evidence for that? Well, actually, in general, many doctors don't understand health statistics. That's partly because of our training uh, and therefore cannot evaluate evidence for and against a treatment. So in a study of 150 consultant gynecologists, a third of them did not actually understand the meaning of a 25% risk reduction from mammography screening for breast cancer. Most of that third believed that if all women were screened, 25% of 250 out of 1,000 would die of breast cancer. Less, 250 out of 1,000 less would die of breast cancer. What does the actual evidence tell us? Well, actually a Cochrane review, analysis of almost half, half a million uh, patients from uh, uh, RCTs, actual randomized trials, actually showed that you'd have to screen 2,000 women to save one life. And when they did a, a smaller study a few years later, not a single one of the gyne consultant gynecologists who were, who were sort of surveyed or, or asked questions on this had actually even mentioned the harms of screening. So for every one woman that's saved from screening for breast cancer out of 2,000, 10 would receive an overtreatment, so either a medication or an operation they didn't need. Now, what's the answer to this? I don't have all the answers here, but I think at the very least, my view on this is that you should have that conversation with the patient when they're deciding whether or not to go for breast cancer screening, based upon the evidence that we have, that there is a potential harm and this is what the potential benefit would be, and let the patient make the decision. I think David Sackett, um, who actually of those three components of evidence-based medicine said, patient values and expectations was the most important. I agree with him. Okay. A little bit more. So a basic statistics lesson here. There are many ways of presenting a benefit. Relative risk or absolute risk or NNT, numbers needed to treat. Communicating relative risks as opposed to the NNT can actually lead lay people and doctors, perhaps more importantly, to overestimate the benefits of medical intervention. So let's give an example. Based upon RCT evidence for type 2 diabetics, taking a set in 10 milligrams for four years, if a patient comes in, they can be told this is, there is a 48% relative risk reduction in having a stroke. Sounds very impressive, doesn't it? And what does it actually mean? If you look at the trial data, instead of 20, 28 in 1,000 people having a stroke with no treatment from a torvastatin in 10, 15 in 1,000 actually it was reduced to 15 in 1,000. So the actual risk reduction, absolute risk reduction, is 1.3%. Okay? So what's another way of communicating that in very simple terms? It means that for that individual who comes into the consultation room and says, Doc, I've been hearing all these magic pill statins. I should be taking them. Actually, what would be more transparent and honest with the patient is to say, 
that if you take a Torvastat in 10 every day for several years, and by the way, this is industry-sponsored data, so we'll come on to that in a minute, best case scenario here. There's a 1 in 77 chance that you take in Torvastat in every day for four years, it will prevent a stroke. Mismatch framing in medical journals has actually compounded the issue. So if treatment A reduces the risk of developing disease from 10 to 7 in 1,000, but actually the harms of that particular treatment increases from 7 to 10 in 1,000, the journal article reports the benefit in relative risk terms, a 30% relative risk reduction, but the harm is 0.3%. One-third of all articles published in JAMA, the BMJ, and the Lancet use mismatch framing between 2004 and 2006 in their publications of their trials. That's extraordinary. And obviously, that such asymmetric presentation of data will exaggerate the benefits and minimize the harms. Now, don't just take my word for it. The leading researcher in the world, one of the leading researchers in the world in health literacy, Gerd Gigerenza, in a World Health Organization bulletin in 2009, you can look this up, he actually says it's an ethical imperative that every doctor and patient understand the difference between absolute relative risks to protect patients against unnecessary anxiety and manipulation. So in other words, you could argue that without using NMTs in conversations with patients, we're practicing unethical medicine. That's what I believe. And certainly we have been unwittingly practicing that for a long time. So let me give you a case study just to put this in perspective. So a 49-year-old chap is seen in outpatients. He had a primary PCI, so evidence-based therapy for PCI, primary PCI, and I'll come on to actually the absolute benefit of that later, uh, has a heart attack. He's then reporting disabling chest pains. He comes to the clinic. It's atypical. It doesn't sound like typical cardiac pain, but obviously we are concerned there may be a restenosis or maybe a, a lesion somewhere else, but just to be on the safe side, after checking there was a no, no acute problem, we rebook him from an angiogram. And uh, I've sp spoken to my... Uh, my consultant, I was an SBR at the time, and he said, okay, let's just get a repeat angio. I do the cath and the cath lab, and he comes in. Everything's fine. Everything's great. He's reassured, but he's, well, doc, what about my chest pain? I've still got this chest pain. And as usual, we think, okay, it could be something else. So here's a proton pump inhibitor. It could be acid reflux. Off, off back to your GP, and then we will see you again in clinic in a few months' time, in a few weeks' time. He's seen back in cardiology six weeks later, his pain's still there, the pros and pump inhibitor hasn't helped, and he's now also complaining of muscle aches, it's with his wife, and he's very, very depressed. And the GP has now referred him to a gastroenterologist, so he's probably going to start, he's going to go and have an endoscopy. So I remember speaking to my consultant at the time, I won't name which hospital this was, and I said, well, you know, and interesting, he said, oh, I've seen, my, I've seen um, the odd patient having chest pain from statin side effects. I said, really? He says, yeah. He says, okay, well, why don't you just see whether reducing the dose or stopping it might help? So I looked at his medication list. He was on high dose of statin, And I said to him, OK, well, we're going to stop your statin for a few weeks. Uh, and if you're better, then you know, restart on a lower dose. We'll go to your GP. Um, and, and that's basically it. And if not, then we'll think of other, other things. So his advice to stop the statin. I'm in clinic the week later, the same day. He turns up uninvited. Uninvited, he comes to the clinic. And he says, Doc. After months of misery, my pain has disappeared. So he stopped his statin seven days later, but now I'm worried my GP has said, you must never stop your statin or you could die. <laughs> now, does anybody here, what is the risk of death in this gentleman? So he's had a heart attack. He's on a statin, evidence-based therapy, evidence-based therapy. Um, what do you think his risk of, of death is from stopping a statin? Any ideas? Can anyone give me a number here for two weeks? Any guesses? <laughs> wow, that's quite high. 25%. Wow. Less than 5%. Interesting. Anyone else? Less than 1%. You're getting closer. 1 in 10,000. If you look at the industry, this is your best case scenario, worst case scenario, 1 in 10,000. Now, you could argue, and I'll come on to this later, because there is selection bias in clinical trials. Patients who are studied in the trials themselves actually don't necessarily represent people in the real world, and certainly people with disabling side effects, is that, if that's what you had from statin, you could argue that's actually even less. It could even be closer to zero, if not zero, if you actually look at the data and you, if you study it in terms of a pure science perspective. Okay, now, a bit of controversy I'm going to bring in here, because I'm sure a lot of you are aware of the statin controversy that's been ongoing, so I want to talk about this. In 2003, um, John Abramson and colleagues at Harvard published a, a reanalysis of... Uh, industry-sponsored data about whether patients at low risk of heart disease, less than 10% risk of cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years, would benefit from taking a statin. 
And what they concluded, these are some of the main, main points, is that, well, some of the key headlines was that, as we've already discussed, lifestyle factors are the most important contributor to heart disease, about 80%. Um, but what they did found was that there was no mortality benefit. If you had less than 10% risk of cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years, taking a statin every day based upon all the available industry-sponsored data would not prolong your life by one day. Okay? There was a very small risk reduction in non-fatal heart attack, but no reduction in serious illness. But the other thing that was mentioned, this is where the controversy started, is that John Ableton and colleagues cited an observational study in the community which basically found that 17.4% of patients after, within a few months of being commenced on a statin had documentation in the notes of statin side effects. Many patients stopped their statin without going back to their GP or their family physician. But now this was rounded up to 20%. And I actually wrote uh, uh, an editorial in the BMJ at the same time about saturated fat not being the main driver of heart disease and we should focus on we should focus on sugar. This was a press release and ended up causing chaos because it went all around the world and CNN and Fox News and you name it. I was doing interviews for them about that. But I also cited the same problem issue and I said we've over-medicated million millions of people on statins. We should be talking about NMT. And um, by the way, I, I still believe, talking about the David Sackett 50%, I still believe most of what I wrote in that, in that editorial. <laughs> anyway, so this, um, this got press release and then what happened was, several months later, March 2014, um, Professor Sir Rory Collins, Professor of Medicine at British Heart Foundation and the co-director of the Clinical Trial Service Unit in Oxford, he actually called for retraction of the piece. In fact, he'd been emailing the editor of the BMJ, this is all public knowledge now, asking for her to retract the pieces. She had actually invited him to publish a critique, but he ignored that. He didn't want to do that. So instead, in the press, in the Guardian, front page of the Guardian, in 2014, March, he goes, you know, he makes this comment, and this is really important because what I'm going to come on to and why there's still a controversy. He said there are side effects that are extremely rare, one in 10,000 essentially, of anything that's really significant. And what wasn't mentioned, which I think was important, is that, you know, the, his unit uh, in Oxford have received tens of millions, if not 200, over 200 million pounds from drug companies that manufacture statins. And I think that certainly there's a conflict of interest there from. From, from my perspective, and I'm sure a lot of people will probably agree with me. But anyway, he called this for retraction, and what ended up happening is the BMJ then felt that because they had a vested interest, because they published the articles, they sent the, uh, both my article and John Abramson's for an independent review about whether it should be retracted. The correction and caveat of the observational study had been made. Uh, it was a very small thing, but uh, anyway, so that had been made. And um, while this independent review was going on, there was more things that was emerging. So myself, and a number of eminent uh, doctors, including Professor Capewell here, we wrote a letter to the Secretary of State for Health because NICE had come out, interestingly, saying that we should essentially start offering patients statins who had low risk. So we've already established that there was no mortality benefit. Interestingly, Rory Collins hadn't challenged that. He picked on the side effects issue. In fact, he had not challenged that if you have a less than 20% risk, there is no overall mortality benefit from taking statins. And we wrote a letter to the Secretary of State for Health and it was signed by a lot of leading doctors, including the former Queen's physician, Sir Richard Thompson. And we basically said that this was a bad idea to lower the threshold. Because the other thing is, if the threshold would be lowered, GPs would be financially incentivized to prescribe statins in the quaff, which is another issue, another problem as well. And there's a, I won't go into a lot of detail. There's a quite an extensive uh, letter that we wrote. But essentially, we mentioned a few things that were important. Most of the NICE guideline panels, sadly, had financial ties or had conflicts of interest directly linked to manufacturers of statins or other cholesterol-lowering drugs. Um, they're not taken into consideration about side effects. And type 2 diabetes is now established as, a, a, as a something that is caused by statins in about 1% of patients. And obviously increased GP appointments, no mortality benefits. So lots of problems and issues. And we said this should not happen. We wrote this letter. It got a lot of coverage. Uh, and also what ended up happening after that is a general practitioners committee of the BMA, the BMR, they, they have to agree on the NICE guidance for it to be introduced into quaff. They actually decided that, that they didn't believe that was the right way forward and they actually, this is quite extraordinary, it's unprecedented by the way that primary care physicians have essentially rejected NICE guidance. And they said based upon the fact that Tamiflu, when we discovered that Tamiflu was not very effective when we had uh, independent access to the data, which we don't have for statins still, that, they, that showed there was no benefit, they actually said that we will reject essentially this NICE guidance until we get complete public exclosure of all clinical trials data. So we had the verdict, so I was basically on trial with John Abramson for a couple of months about whether my piece would be retracted, 6-0 in our favour, independent panel in America, 
and basically decided that there was no real reason for retraction and there was legitimate discussions and questions that were being asked in these papers. Um, so we move on, but I thought that was the end of it, but no, there was more controversy. Around the time of our papers being published in the BMJ, completely coincidentally, um, a, uh, an eminent, a very sort of an award-winning journalist actually at that stage, Marion de Massey, uh, had, had basically done two documentaries back-to-back -back in Australia, one about saturated fat, but the other one about statins. And she'd interviewed Rita Redberg and some other eminent doctors, including John Abramson. And um, this uh, documentary called Heart of the Matter, which you can find on YouTube, ultimately got pulled, not because she made any factual inaccuracies questioning about statins and low-risk people and talking about NMT, but because apparently they'd breached impartiality, which I think was questionable. And when this, um, this uh, documentary aired in Australia and got a lot of attention, there were a few people coming out and saying, similar to what Rory Collins had also uh, asserted in his Guardian, uh, in the Guardian feature, was that people will die because of this. Scare only on statins, people will die. So June 2015, we move on. The Medical Journal of Australia publishes a paper in Australia saying that as a result of this catalyst program, they've calculated this many people in the community have stopped statins, and 2,900 people may have suffered a heart attack or died as a result of stopping their statin. Okay? Now, guess what? There was no registry data to back this up. In fact, the last thing we would want as doctors is something we do, especially I'm in the, you know, people in the media who have a media profile to say something that harms public and patients. There was no evidence of a single death. Not one heart attack or death. Now, I can explain this scientifically later on, but there wasn't any evidence of it. This is all extrapolations from industry-sponsored data and did not apply to the population. And also, we don't know why people were taking statins. Was it low risk, high risk? We don't know all of that, all of that information. Now, what's... Okay, all right. Um, I'll try and get through this as quickly as possible. So, essentially, what happened a month earlier is, uh, which is also concerning, didn't get enough attention, the, the editor of the Medical Journal of Australia had been sacked before this publication for questioning increasing commercial influence over the journal. Um, there's also a French physician uh, in, uh, in Grenoble University who's a, a reputed cardiologist, no conflict of interest. He has actually come out with a paper suggesting that secondary prevention, there is very questionable benefit in secondary prevention. It's a very interesting paper and worth reading. And Richard Thompson also f believes that we need to get access to the raw data because this controversy will continue. Um, Simon uh, mentioned earlier about conflicts of interest with the food industry and um, Eminent professor over there also talked about pharma. Well, let's just, there's some important bits of information I think we need to understand. Drug companies actually, and medical device companies, have a fiduciary obligation to produce profit for their shareholders, not produce a shareholder, um, not um, to actually give you the best treatment. Most people think that to be the case. Um, but the real scandals, as Peter Wilms just points out, is that regulators fail to prevent misconduct by industry and doctors, institutions, and journals that have responsibilities to patients and scientific integrity collude with industry for financial gain. Now, one of the problems we have, we keep hearing about, is the innovation crisis. Part of the issue is a system failure that essentially incentivizes drug companies to spend a lot more money on marketing than they do in research and development. And an analysis has shown three quarters, essentially, of most of the new drugs that have been produced in the last decade are essentially copies of old ones. They're no better than the previous drug. Only 11% of them have actually been proven to be truly innovative. What other bits of evidence do I have about con con concerns about commercial influence? The former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, who'd worked at the journal for 20 years, said it's no, no longer possible to trust much of the clinical research that is published, or rely on judgment of trusted physicians or medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I read slowly and reluctantly over my two decades. Is she an isol as the editor of the New England Journal of Medicine? Is she an isolated case? Richard Horton writes an editorial in, um, online, the editor of The Lancet, possibly half from a meeting he'd attended to the Wellcome Trust Chatham House rules, and he wrote, possibly half of the published literature may be untrue. And uh, former editor of the BMJ, Richard Smith, um, in response to a meeting he'd attended where he asked an audience uh, who were there, sort of reputed scientists, how many, of them, how many of you are aware of research misconduct that has taken place in, in your institution, in your career? A third to a half put their hand up. How many of you have reported it? Everybody put their hand down. Okay, um, I'm not much, much time here, but essentially around statins, one of the problems is when you look at the community studies done before any of this media hype, most patients discontinue statins within a year of prescription. Most of those stat, stat, uh, cite statin side effects. Moving on, a Sunday Times investigation actually found that um, following a Lancet review at the end of last year, um, Professor Collins, uh, and this, this is very puzzling to me, but 
Professor Collins basically, um, who you know has been long, you know really been quite public about his concerns about statin side effects being overestimated. Um, he had actually co-invented a, a, a device that actually tells you whether you're likely to get side effects from statins. And this was being marketed in America to the consumer for $99, basically on a claim that 29% of all statin users by Boston Heart Diagnostics will suffer significant muscle pain. And the royalties of the patent were you know, used for university research funding. Uh, Professor Collins said that he obviously didn't receive any personal uh, fees from this and said that the, the, the figure was misleading. Um, Boston Heart Diagnostics, interestingly, actually stood by their claim saying that a task force on statin safety in the US had concluded that RCTs are not reliable for statin side effects because they often excluded patients with side effects in run-in periods. Um, Sunday Times did an FOI request to Oxford to find out if they'd received any money from this, the sale of this device. Um, and that, in fact, it was about over 300,000 uh, pounds to Oxford had gone, from, uh, had gone to Oxford from the sale of this device. Um, and 120,000 plus to Oxford CTSU. I personally feel this requires further explanation and investigation. Um, I, don't think, I don't know if any of you here will disagree with me. If you do, please raise your hand. Interesting, it's unanimous. Um, <laughs> coded question there. <laughs> um, we've, been, we've detracted from lifestyle clearly. Simon's talked about this. There's a big problem with over treatment. Part of it is a perception problem, you know, because some people, we know this patients think, they take a stat and you can eat what you like. You know, I've seen patients that, that have this mentality. It's clearly two separate problems here, two separate issues. What can we do about it? Sorry, I'll, I'll finish very quickly. Um, I was uh, honored to be a, a lead author on a paper that was co which was written to BMJ, co-authored with the now chair of the GMC and the chair of the academy, uh, uh, Sue Bailey, basically calling to, you know, you know, emphasizing all these major issues, essentially, about how we need to be more transparent with patients. And uh, we, we called for a campaign to reduce the <laughs> harms of the treatment. Uh, and part of it involves being more transparent with patients. And I'll just finish, because I think we're, we're almost done here, just uh, with a little quiz. But I mean, some of this also is empowering patients to ask questions about benefits and risks of, of treatments. OK, so last slide, penultimate slide. So numbers needed to treat for mortality, OK, for common treatments in heart disease. Uh, just mortality for secondary prevention and primary prevention. So aspirin, you take aspirin every day for five years, you've had a heart attack, there's a one in 100 chance that aspirin will save your life. One in 100, based upon RCT evidence. Statins, based upon uh, the trial data we have available, 83 for mortality, one in 83, about one in 39 for recurrent heart attack, if you've had a heart attack. Aspirin and statins are low risk, there's no mortality benefit. You're not gonna live one day longer if you're low risk taking aspirin or statin. Coronary stents, primary PCI, 1 in 40, NNT, the PCI itself, with everything else you're doing, will, uh, 1 in 40 chance that it will save your life. Stents at any other time, we know for mortality, there's no mortality benefit whatsoever. So, what's, oh, I'm giving it away. What's the most, <laughs> what's the most powerful intervention based upon RCT evidence that we have in secondary prevention, uh, more than anything else, it's a Mediterranean diet. Now, this is one RCT, it was independent of industry, um, Leon Hart study, it showed a mortality benefit of 30. Small study, but still very powerful information. But this sort of information, we've suppressed it, we've kept it away from patients. You know, we have this information available for more transparent discussions. And only when everybody in the room knows that a stent for stable disease, including the, the patient, the doctor, the nurse, the receptionist, when they know that a stent for stable disease is not going to prevent a heart attack or prolonged life, but a Mediterranean, diet is a, a Mediterranean diet is probably the most powerful coronary intervention tool we have, that's when you have real transparency, that's when you have accountability, and that's when you have better quality care. And until we have this, we're not gonna get better quality healthcare, which is failing our patients currently. Um, vested interests, unfortunately, have, have hijacked evidence-based medicine. I'll leave you with a, a quote from the second president of the United States, John Adams. And he says, the preservation of the means of knowledge amongst the lowest ranks is of more importance to the public than all the property of all the rich men in the country. Thank you very much.
two questions. First is, does not nice screen people when they um, go on panels and say, no, you can't talk about that. You can come in the committee or council to talk about that. You're not talking about that short money from that, that company. To what extent do you think that helps? And the other, I shall just put my other one that'll do. <laughs> Um, I think it's really important. They, there is declarations. I think the system has improved slightly. But the declarations itself doesn't remove the bias. And I think part of the mentality is that a lot of the people who are considered experts tend to have some financial, because you know, the, the industry essentially funds institutions, etc., and they fund researchers who then become the experts. So my view is this, that you know, a lot of, you know, as I teach my medical students, medicine is not an exact science. It's more the practice of the art of probability. And uh, other independent people can analyze you know, information and data to make decisions that help guidance. I don't think anybody should have conflicts of interest on a guideline panel. And unfortunately, the system has allowed that to happen for a very long time, and that needs to change. I have to remember another question. <laughs> <laughs> the, journal, the medical journals, since 2006, have they not improved about what people have to report? To any degree, or what's your opinion on that? No, I don't think they have very much. And the BMJ and, and JAMA Internal Medicine are probably two journals that are leading the way on this. Um, but just to give you one example, uh, well, they, the, it, it's a mixed bag. Um, a lot of the headlines that are generated from new research that comes out, unfortunately, still uses, you'll see, a relative risk. I mean, one example is this recent Imperial College study on pravastatin and taking pravastatin in the long term, which was has lots of issues and, and concerns, but you know, that was reported a few weeks ago as about an 18% reduction in mortality without actually talking about numbers needed to treat, etc., etc. So there's a lot, a long way to go. I think we'll stop there. I think um, Dr. Mohawk is around for the rest of the day and tonight, so I believe, so I'm sure that people will come up and ask some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.